Hello everyone, and welcome to Five Obscure Demons You Need to Know About by Wes Hammer. Um, for other uh, reactions we've done, please go here, 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 basically there, because that's where we put our playlist of every Warhammer reaction we've done. So we do a Warhammer 40k. Ooh. Um, you've got Wes Hammer there, you've got Bricky there, you know, go check them out, they're pretty good. Me just being very confused. Judy being very confused. Me being very happy, <laughs> overly happy. Um, yes, I am in a mixture mood of very excited, very happy, and very um, sad. Very sad. Ba -doing, ba -doing, ba -doing. No, that was over the last video. <laughs> That's from the Big Les show, <laughs> which, and which Nick. may have been released before now. I'm not sure. But ba -doing, ba -doing, no, ba -doing. no, <laughs> no, I hate it. Quit it. <laughs> Make it end. <laughs> Didn't say it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> you just listen with Nathan the couch. <laughs> but I like it. I did. I never heard a sloth make that noise before. It's because it's a cartoon. Oh, you're ready to come. <laughs> All right, right. Thank you. Right to everyone. Please go and watch the original video. Give the your love to the original creator, and we will see. Well, we will see us throughout the video. What am I going to say? You're not going to see us in a bit. You're going to see us in the video. So we... Anyway, let's begin. If you've been following Warhammer 40k for any length of time, then you've definitely seen a whole host of different types of demons. From the sa- <laughs> Yes, you have. <laughs> With you, but like, otherwise, I'm lost. But you show me. Not like this person's probably seen it like thousands of times and knows everything. That's a bloodthirster. Savage and towering bloodthirsters of corn, all the way down to the tiny and hilarious, and also admittedly still terrifying demons known as Nurglings. But Warhammer but 40k is a massive universe, and it's full of obscure demons that very rarely get highlighted in the lore. And some of these things are absolutely crazy. From a shattered demon that fused with an imperial warship, to be what? reborn as a new demon lord. Psychic ghosts that are generated when psychers don't have full control over their abilities cool. and exist as spectral space vampires that delight in causing terror. There's even a host of demons that exist solely to enforce contracts. And those contracts may see you becoming rich beyond your wildest dreams, but they're also just as likely to see you get dragged kicking and screaming into the void. We're going to be talking about all that and a whole lot more. But first, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're going to dive headfirst. Please watch the full... Oh, well, his full video to be the sponsor. Number five, the Eye of the Abyss. For this entry, we're going to be diving back into the Kalexis sector, uh, one of the most dangerous and mysterious sections of space within the entirety of the 40k universe. There's an area here known as Hazaroth's Abyss. It is a vast and barren subsector, lightless and cold, and exists as something of a stellar graveyard. The sections of this area that are not just vast expanses of empty void are scattered with the debris of dead star systems and long frozen worlds. In fact, the only stars here that are still active are incredibly old and have grown fat, bloated, and dim. There are people that live here, but it is scarcely populated and incredibly difficult to navigate through as the warp routes that lead through the abyss are known to be some of the galaxy's most unpredictable. In the section of the warp that connects to the abyss, it is said that long ago, there was an incredibly powerful demonic entity that met an untimely end. We don't know what their name was or what exactly happened to them, but the aftermath of this event saw them shattered into thousands of pieces. And one of those shards would escape destruction when by chance, it came across a drifting space hulk in the warp, a long dead ship that had gone unhelmed for countless years. Like a suckling demonic scavenger, the shard began to merge with the ship feasting on the ancient corpses of the previous crew and the ship's dormant machine spirit. It absorbed all of their knowledge, and as time moved forward, the shard would regain its sentience and come to fully fuse with the long-lost vessel. Through this bizarre union, a new demon lord was born, cast in the form of an imperial warship. This thing is known as the Eye of the Abyss, and it, along with the parasitic colony of lesser warp entities that dwell within its bloated carcass, lie in wait in Hazaroth's warp routes, waiting to ambush vessels that are attempting to navigate this dangerous area. The thing is, even if its prey is able to act quickly enough and drop out of the warp, 
this demon has the remarkable ability to follow them right on through, Ooh. right into the physical universe, which That's is funny. a ridiculous feat of power for a warp entity, as even the strongest greater demons still require a vast cult in order to summon them into real space. The fact that the Eye of the Abyss can just do this at will is frankly ridiculous. It appears as a five kilometer long heavy imperial cruiser that has been so twisted and warped that it's impossible to tell its exact pattern. It is covered in thousands of distinct demonic entities that trail across its surface like mites on a whale, each engaged in a cackling circus of violence and debauchery. Massive rune-shaped fields of burning, broiling warp matter act as its source of ammunition that the greater demonic entities that serve as the Eye of the Void's cannons use to hurl or vomit forth explosive projectiles across the void. The ammunition that it fires is horrifically corrupted and can cause a ship hit by it to immediately begin to corrode on impact. The bubbling ichor at the impact point not only beginning to tear huge sections of the ship open to the void, but also giving birth to hordes of demonic entities that rip and tear at the ship's hull, desperate to get inside and feast on the crew within. All the while, the etheric energy generated by the ammunition leeches inside of the ship, infecting the minds of all that come into contact with it, driving them into a frothing madness. If that wasn't bad enough, the Eye of the Abyss also wields crackling tendrils of empowered demonic flesh that extend out for a kilometer and lash out at anything within range. Right up front is an enormous 400 meter wide bloodshot eyeball that has come to replace the vessel's command cathedral. Now, as ridiculous of a feat as a demon just summoning itself into real space is, this is admittedly something that the ship is not capable of maintaining indefinitely. It makes me think though, how powerful was, was the demon, the demon the when it was all together and as one? And it's only a little piece of it made that thing? I mean, it makes you interested. Like, I want to see or know what the full thing was like. Seriously. Hmm. And normally the Eye of the Abyss can only maintain this for a couple of hours before being forced to return to the Immaterium. This, however, so is more than enough warp, time like it has to for the turn quickly, right? Yes. So like it can leave, but it has to turn quickly because it's a power source. Yeah, but then if you think about it, even the greatest, most powerful demons can't do, can't even summon themselves. So that's a big deal then. Yeah. Okay. Ship to destroy its prey and drag the souls of its damned crew back into the warp. In my opinion, the Eye of the Abyss is one of the coolest demonic entities mm, I've personally is. ever read about. And I really hope we get to see more of this thing in the future. Interesting. Number four, the Lady of the Voids. Across space and time, there are tales of malevolent entities that dwell deep within the ocean, rising to the surface only to prey upon the unsuspecting mortals that would dare sail through their territory uninvited. They often take the form of beautiful women with angelic voices who can twist and turn the hearts and minds of mortal men, infecting them with insanity and causing them to forego their base survival instincts to throw themselves overboard. The sailor who wanted nothing more than a kiss is instead dragged down into a cold, watery grave. In our history, we refer to such entities as sirens, but within the warp routes that connect the stars in the 42nd millennium, these legends have come to take on a different form entirely, one that spacefarers refer to as the Lady of the Voids a foul demon of Slanesh that lurks between the stars, a terrifying witch queen whose only desire is to sunder vessels and tear the living breath from its crewmen's bodies. Although they are without a doubt demons of Slanesh, we don't exactly know what breed of demon they are. And unlike other demons whose etheric energy in the warp is only able to ineffectually follow after a ship but not harm it so long as their geller fields remain active, the Lady of the Voids is far more equipped to take on such prey by taking advantage of a moment of I think it's um I think it's a demon of Slanesh, a female demon. So like beforehand it's just the other, the normal ones are just like pretty women that are monsters yeah. that take men. But this one's like really twisted. She can get anything. Yeah. Okay. Typical Slanesh. I mean, she shows men's weakness. Of mental weakness. <laughs> the lady's many voices scream and moan in the patterns of the warp their dreadful song enrapturing any that can hear it, piercing the ears and numbing weak minds Maybe to those who have become that. afflicted by the well, They could affect you because you'd be like, go away, I'm eating my sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Not care interested. what you're doing. Not interested, go away. The song 
the lady appears in their subconscious as the most beautiful person they can imagine. Their sanity quickly deteriorating as the warp song melts their mind. And Unless what appears in front of me is like a massive fat just BLT sandwich, I don't care. <laughs> Eventually, a frenzied madness will take over them. There are documented reports of crewmen who have heard such a serenade mutilating themselves or others in an attempt to destroy the tech devices that keep the Gellerfields active, or in some cases, open the vessel's seal gates to let the cold, sucking void inside. Once inside a ship, the demon will happily sweep through the vessel at the head of a growing horde of insane crewmen, her song echoing down the halls, and with each reverberation, multiplying the suffering of her enslaved puppets in an orgy of destruction and death. There are other reports of a Lady of the Voids materializing inside of the mind of a weak-willed astropath that willingly let her in. The creature burst forth in a violent explosion of viscera and gore, like. emerging from the ruined body as a twisted amalgamation of hundreds of different women, their faces, arms, and mouths facing in different directions, her torso appearing as a hideous mix of woman, crab, and bloated toad whilst half of her limbs end in spiny pincers. It's difficult to determine just how many vessels within the Kalexis sector have been lost to such an attack, but thankfully, there have been a few survivors who were able to make reports to the Inquisition, and most of these survivors took the form of tech adepts of the Adeptus Mechanicus, whose rejection of the flesh and devotion to the machine protected them from the Lady's psychic attacks. We don't know how many of them are out there, or if the Lady of the Voids is simply so why not send, like, a group of them to go looking for it? If not look for it, study it. Then how to defeat it. I mean, I think that she wants to attack what she knows. If there is a disorder of damage, it's not going to be bothered by Inquisition. That's why you leave an enemy of the Imperium there. You just take some prisoners that you didn't want. Yeah, exactly. Just Use them as bait. There you go a precursor to an entirely new wave of Slaneshi demons, but as of right now, they remain a terrifying threat to any who would attempt sail within the Kalexis sector. Number three, the Glitchlings of Nurgle. Okay, so the last couple of entries were a bit heavy, so let's talk about something that's a little bit more comical. It, but admittedly, at the end of the day, this is still Warhammer 40k, so it's got to be super grimdark. Nurgle. Everybody knows about Nurglings, the tiny little bloated and jolly mites of Nurgle. The Plague Lord's Adorable. most special little children that love to bite, chew, and roll around on the battlefield like a pestilent little swarm of jolly imps. These little terrible bastards are great and everybody loves them. Even if you're not a fan of chaos, you can't not love the Nurglings. But did you know that Nurglings have a disturbing mechanical cousin known as the Glitchlings? The major difference between a Nurgling and a Glitchling is that the Nurglings spread plagues that rot the flesh and corrupt the body, whereas the techno plagues of the Glitchlings infect circuitry, contaminate mechanical parts, and degrade metal. Ooh. You see, the Glitchlings okay. were first created when the Primarch of the Iron Warriors, Perturabo, made a pact with Nurgle to pervert the eight rituals of possession. They did this in order to turn them against the forge world known as Toil. This was a combined effort by not just the Iron Warriors, but also all of the machines of this world as they were corrupted into nightmarish cybernetic horrors, a blasphemous fusion of corrupted steel and demonic flesh. Now, amongst these grotesque mechanical creatures were hordes of tiny, plumped, nurgling-shaped abominations that crackled with demonic scrap code and glowed with baleful energy. These things ran wild across the battle. Now we're on the topic, the video I'm working on, due to the poll we did uh, about nearly a week ago, mm -hmm. Tugath Plague Father, will be coming soon. Okay. Just, just thought I'd, I'd, I'd say that. And yeah, see if anyone's excited over it. I'm putting, a, I'm putting a lot of time into it, so don't expect the video too soon, because I was putting my time and effort into it. We recorded a first batch of it yesterday, um, along, with, a slow week. along with another announcement. We've had a very slow week. Um, we've got another announcement to make as well, but you'll see that in the video, so... Thank you. Yeah, so that's kind of my agenda. Just thought I just thought I'd mention it. I'll be guys. I mean, I'm excited about it. It's it's a good it's a good little uh, two teasers. Yeah. I'm pretty proud of myself for both of them. So oh, I've also got uh, another announcement to make another time. That'll be a different video. That'll be uh, a channel trailer, just so people know what's happening, what's going on. Anyway, you probably haven't made it this far in the video, so you won't know this. But thanks for watching.
battlefield. While the defenders of the Forge World's guns were trained on larger targets, their disruptive aura causing cogitators, electro lumens, and machine spirits to falter or go haywire. This caused the Imperial Defender's defense systems and weapons to fail them, as the machine plague known as the Gellerpox ran rampant. Wherever the Glitchlings end up, long-cherished guns and fine working order suddenly fail. Reliable servitors stumble to a grinding halt, and tanks in pristine condition suddenly rust as if aged hundreds of years in the blink of an eye. Although the Glitchlings' greatest joy is disrupting the technology of mortal races, they are malicious, evil little bastards that find it immensely entertaining to stab or bite foes that are distracted by the malfunctioning weapons. Although relatively weak one-on-one, -on -one, a glitchling secretes a noxious substance that covers their claws, teeth, and tiny little blades so that any wound they cause is full of infectious disease. Their one true joy in life is spreading mayhem. They gurgle nonsensical words and emit spark-filled belches as they roll across the battlefield in small packs of gibbering, laughing gremlins. <laughs> it's not exactly known what their connection with the Gellerpox virus ultimately is, but without fail, every single major outbreak that's been reported so far was accompanied by an entire host of these tiny mischief makers. Number two, the Astral Spectres. Being born into the Imperium of Man as a Psyker is a one-way ticket to a very hard life. They are often either mistreated, hunted, or persecuted, and are seen as a constant source of fear and anxiety, even though most psychers are born with relatively harmless powers that make them more of an outcast than anything else. These abilities can take the form of somebody being able to read another person's thoughts or emotions. However, like in Rogue Trader, the game. Yeah. Yeah. Pick up. There are individuals who are born with particularly violent and dangerous psychic abilities, and without proper training and discipline, they can become an immediate threat to everything and everyone around them. That's when said psychic powers are wielded by those who are said to be weak in faith or will, the energy they generate can congeal within the fabric of the warp to form a terrifying creature known as an astral specter, a malevolent shadow, a creature made of pure psychic runoff. That energy is not unlimited, however, and thus the creatures exist as an ethereal vampire that replenishes their own energy by devouring the souls of mortal men and women. The astral specters have shown a perverse obsession with causing fear, relishing in the terror their attacks generate. They are drawn to fear and will expend great efforts to cause it. It's almost like they are addicted to it, as there are many reports of specters putting themselves at risk in order to terrify a potential victim, appearing in their true nightmarish form. As no two psychers are wholly unique, the astral specters they generate can also come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. They do, That's however, scary. have a few traits mm -hmm. in common. Most are said to be comprised of patches of semi-translucent shadows and maintain a vaguely humanoid appearance, no. even though their body does not okay. possess an actual physical form. They wield a wide array of different psychic abilities, and it is said that their presence unnerves all sentient creatures in their vicinity. It would suck to be born into the, war, the world of Warhammer. Yeah, yeah, true. In both fantasy and 40k, that would suck. Like, you have a really bad life. Like, I can't even, like, there is nowhere safe. You won't go anywhere. Underground, Skaven. It's safe if you're in the fantasy world. Underground, Skaven. The, the mountains, orcs. Big spiders. The woods, aren't they? The woods, the beastmen. The Arctic, the Norsemen, chaos. Like, there's nothing. Oh, the forest. Dinosaurs. Don't forget 40k though, that there's like no planet is actually safe. But 40k, the ocean's definitely full of dangerous monsters. And then you decide to go to a distant world, which would turns out to be a Necron doom world or something. End up in a warp by accident, you don't blink. End up in a warp. If you sleep wrong, you might find that extra in your bed. Exactly. Like, come on. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> you might as well just lock yourself in a room and never open. Yep. Ever. Ace, what do we do? Often causing them to experience a wide array of psychic phenomena. When a specter attacks, it will almost always target a psyker first. At first and foremost, the bountiful feast of energy they provide is far more nourishing to a specter than any regular person. And conversely, as they are a being wrought from the ethereal energies of the immaterium, the psychers pose a much more significant threat to them. They will attempt to manipulate the minds of weaker opponents, causing them to interfere with or even attack their allies. If cornered, 
they will unleash their psychic powers in an all-out attack or even attempt to possess one of their targets. They are cunning and intelligent and always seek to take a host who is either capable of fighting their way out of a situation or by possessing an individual their allies will not attack. For some unknown reason, sightings of astral specters have been on the rise within the Kalexis sector, appearing in large quantities in areas Ooh. dominated by violence, where there. great numbers of innocent... Hive world, shrine world, agri world, feudal world, feral world, pleasure... Oh, okay. Penal world, mining world, forge world, cemetery world, frontier world, special, uh, forbidden world, dead world, gas giant... Um, can't really see any dead worlds. Uh, gas giant. Yeah, I've seen one of them. Two of them. Uh, death world. Uh, war world unclassified. There's a forbidden world around there. Hmm. There's a forbidden world. Look at the corner. Is there a dead world? Um, yeah, right there, I think. Hmm. Yeah, right there. Oh, there is, yes. Okay. The ones over here. Hmm. Okay. There's just a lot looking at. Mm -hmm. Citizens have been killed. Whatever the exact cause of this phenomena is, the Inquisition has been monitoring the situation carefully. I bet. Number one, the assessors of the Black Taunt team. That thing's terrifying. The final demon that, that I want to talk about today is one that we don't get to see in the lore very often, as they have a very specific purpose. They're known as the assessors of the Black Taunt team. And if you don't know what a tauntine is, it's actually a real world thing. It's a contract in which all of the signers are paid dividends. Now said dividends are small at first, but when each shareholder dies, all of their shares and wealth get added to the pool and thus further enrich the living shareholders. The value continuing to go up and up as less and less shareholders turn up to collect each year. I'm not a legal or history buff, so I'm sure somebody in the comment section knows a lot more about these types of arrangements than I do, but that's the basic gist of it. These types of contracts are something that are relatively common within the Imperium of Man and are used by guild members or brotherhoods from different orders. They are commonly seen as a tradition of the poor, hive manufactory workers signing these holy contracts in blood from their own pierced fingers. Most will pledge what little they have to the hands of the merchant guilders at some form of signing ceremony. The value of the compact to be repaid to the signees as the others begin to die off. It's literally gambling with your life, but as we've seen the horrors of what it's like gamble. to live in the Underhive, most who enter into such an agreement potentially felt like they didn't have much of a choice. This concept is not... Remember, um, Hive worlds are not good. Hive worlds are where billions of people live, and if you're at the bottom levels of it, you're, you're screwed. So you are forced to basically sign that awful, awful paper. Yeah, or, yeah, you, you have no choice. Unique to the Imperium. Because if you want to attain, if you want, if you want, so if you make an agreement with a demon, that if you have the luck to go up the ranks of nobility. Yeah. From the bottom. Mm -hmm. Like, way bottom, like, under hive. Under, okay. you got to sign, sign away. But it could be your most prized possession, meaning your family members, like, say, your daughter your son, your most loved person. So really, I'll do eyes. it's a really twisted way. It's a really twisted thing. Imperium, as the ruinous powers have recast the tradition. That's just what I've seen from it. In an unholy mockery known as the Black Tauntines. They are a murderous compact, scribed in filth upon human skin, made by the ignorant with demons for the betterment of sorcerers. Instead of the contract being assessed by an imperial clerk that sits behind a desk covered in stacks of imperial thrones, one of the most common currencies used within the Imperium, these contracts are enforced by the demonic assessors, who manifest to bestow the sorcerer who created it with powers pulled directly from the warp, taking only a single soul at a time as payment. So this is how it works. A sorcerer creates the contract, then convinces a bunch of laborers to sign it, the assessors show up to claim payment in the form of one soul at a time, snatching away one of the workers, and then with each death, the sorcerer bestows payment on all the living signees and draws a little bit more power out of the warp. In the late 5th century of M41, there was an infamous account of a disguised sorcerer creating a- What would stop the demon from being like, all right, we've run out of people who signed it, now it's your turn? Nothing, I don't think. A black- I hope that power you took is gonna work. 
Pontine in a glass manufactorum in the outer Tarsus. It was believed the sorcerer was able to convince uh, thousands of Havilarch to sign the blasphemous contract. Everything seemed normal at first, until they began to appear. Malevolent cloaked entities who would materialize each day to drag away a single screaming soul as payment for the potency of an inner circle of the glassmaker's guild. The heretic sorcerer and his brotherhood bestowing a few thrones upon the other workers with each victim they took. Whatever the assessor's terrifying true form actually is, is unknown. As they exist as shadows beneath rotten cloaks, they appear as a dire man-shaped being with gnarled, twisted fingers that often resemble thrashing tentacles or elongated needle-like talons. They carry with them a massive jagged hook at the end of a long polearm that they use to drag yeah, their prey yeah, into the war. As threatening as this weapon is, they don't actually need it, as it is said that the assessor's gaze and eldritch words are enough to crush the mind and compel their victims to their death. They don't simply manifest to claim payment, but will also- I'm starting to understand why so many people fall to chaos in, um, in the Warhammer world. I'm actually starting to understand, because they want to they wanna leave that- That awfulness. Yeah, like, Nurgle, like you're suffering from a plague given to you because you live in a hive city in the under levels and you're given a plague because of those above you. You're going to give yourself to Nurgle just to get away from the pain. These people are literally signing their lives away daily and one gets cut to kill and last live. Mm. So Anesh, you pledge yourself to, to them because you want just to have pleasure in your life because you're bored of like where you are, the squalor you're in. You hate, your, you hate your life yeah. so you just want to make it better. Zeech, you probably want to learn something because you want to change something if you want to change the situation you're in. Koan, you just hate something. You just want to well, murder them. Like, he will egg you on to do that. So Also appear to defend a compact. Any attacks made on the Sinese or the sorcerer who created the Tontine will usher forth the vengeance of the warp in the form of the assessors. Most of these contracts have diabolical yet admittedly simple terms but there are accounts of some that have increasingly esoteric rules that must be followed. A signee or even one of the sorcerers breaking said terms will invite the assessor's wrath. What's really interesting about these guys is how frankly not chaotic they are. They're definitely evil, but they have guidelines that they hold as sacred and must follow. It's said that if one was crazy enough to do so, the assessors can actually be debated in lawyerly high gothic on the existence of loopholes. However, it's also said that doing so is all- Wait, you can debate them if you deserve to die? <laughs> no, I don't think I deserve to die. It's okay, no, no, no. Just, no, no, I mean- Not today. Wasn't dealing with it. Don't you see, that you said a soul every day. I gave you two souls yesterday. I think that should roll over. Farewell. Okay. You could have one day left. Thank you ultimately futile and will only buy one's time as success or failure ends in pretty much the same result. Hmm. The only difference being the anger of the assessor when it slaughters one foolish enough to act as a proctor to demons. And oh. that was five super obscure creepy demons from Warhammer. They are creepy. Well, that answered me, didn't it? Like, I thought you could uh, against them. They'll just be like, no, we'll kill you anyway. Oh, okay, cool. Well, that was a uh, West Ham's video, five obscure demons you need to know about. Well, how was that? Creepy. Your favorite? The little nerdy, the little. Oh, yeah, they're my favorite too. The glitch things. They're so cool. So um, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Do on they our get cake? Do they get cutie face like cupcakes and like sprinkles? <laughs> sprinkles. So if we do make a Warhammer walkthrough <laughs> on the game, you're gonna be naming all your stuff that. Yeah. Why? We're gonna have all cute little names. Why? Fluffy. Fluffy. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for watching, everyone. We will see you next time. Bye bye. Time to grind, get inside your mind. Yeah, we working overtime. That's the only way to climb. We gon' make it in our prime. Signing on the dotted line, cashing checks left and right. That's the way I'm living life. Uh, I feel alive when I got a goal inside.